Alex Steele, welcome to Bloomberg Commodities Edge. We focus on the companies, physical assets, and the trading behind the hottest commodities with the smartest voices in the business. Well, let's get right to the data dig here and dig deep into some of the meaty market stories of the week. Really interesting inventory data out in the U.S. Stocks rising a whopping 15.2 million barrels last week. The majority of it, though, coming in pad three on the Gulf Coast. Sure, you can blame it on higher imports and lower exports, but gasoline demand fell. Distillate demand was down 10% below its seasonal level. The irony is prices barely blinked. Well, check out this Wittermaker trade, the natural gas trade that everybody knows is living up to its name. You keep betting money and you make no money. So the spread between March and April futures, that's a bet on just how tight supplies of the fuel will be at the end of the North American winter. That collapsed to less than zero on Tuesday for the first time it's done so this early in the heating season since 2015. Now, the hope was that the cold winter would actually save the day. Market says, nah, pretty unlikely. And finally, China is sticking to the U.S. trade deal and then some. So this season, China bought an unprecedented 11.2 million tons of corn, up almost 1,300 percent compared with pre-trade war purchases. China also bought almost 30 million tons of soybeans. That's 57 percent of America's export sales. All right, now let's get into the ring. With today's top story, I'm looking at gold. Prices sitting barely above their 200-day moving average. Joining me now, Bloomberg's Eddie Vanderwalt. Hey, Eddie, help me out here. Where are we going to go with gold? What's the short versus downside? Uh, Alex, I can see uh, I'm talking to somebody who really knows the gold market because I think that 200-day average is, is important. And really what I've seen over the last couple of days is that the uh, the 50-day 50, the 50 is now trending lower, the 100-day is trending lower. And this isn't just technicals for gold, right? Gold is a, is a, is a, is a commodity that likes to trend. Uh, you, you, you see these big moves. People get excited about it. People buy into the big moves. But when those big moves peter out, as we've seen since August, then, uh, you, you know, it the, the gold market can run out of steam. And I think that's what we're seeing here. Gold's run out of momentum for the moment. But the one thing that's different from when I covered gold is Bitcoin. And I have to wonder, are investors <sighs> literally selling gold and buying Bitcoin? Is it that simple? <sighs> I think there's a bit more to it than that. I, look, I think there are definitely some people that I have spoken to that said, look, I sold my gold and I'm getting into Bitcoin. I think if you are, if you're an, an, a, a professional investor, though, these two commodity, these two assets do very different things. Gold has a certain volatility and it has a certain correlation to other assets, whereas Bitcoin plays in a very different way in a in a in a portfolio that's not to say that i don't think you know a lot of people are getting into bitcoin and, and being excited about the prospect of it someday becoming gold but that makes it a tech stock that doesn't make it a store of value just there just yet that makes it a risk on trade rather than the risk off Absolutely. trade um eddie good stuff i really appreciate it bloomberg's eddie vanderwald in london Time now for Commodity in Chief, where we delve into one topic and one person in the commodity world. Today, it's utilities. So 30 years ago, more than half of all power generation in the U.S. came from coal and natural gas. In 30 years from now, it will come from sun and wind. Currently, the energy mix is kind of a hodgepodge. Natural gas makes up 33% of power, followed by nuclear, with wind and coal not that far behind. Enter Duke Energy, the biggest electric utility in the U.S., with 7.7 .7 million customers all across the Carolinas, Florida, Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. Its goal, net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Here are some of the ways it can get there. Invest in things like energy storage, beef up its renewable power portfolio, and zero out methane emissions from natural gas plants. But it's expensive. Duke is adding billions to its capital plan for the next few years, and you could also be on the hook. So the company ran multiple scenarios and found that the cost of going green could add anywhere from $21 to $58 to your monthly electric bill in 15 years. The question becomes, would you pay for it? Well, I sat down with CEO of Duke Energy, Lynn Good, and asked her what she learned from the report and how Duke makes their decisions for future growth. We presented two scenarios on a 70% carbon reduction. One uh, had a lot of offshore wind and the transmission necessary to make that happen. And then the second one introduced the notion of a small modular reactor. And could that be used as a technique in the early 2030s uh, to achieve 70% reduction? And it's been just a really great opportunity to, to showcase the trade-offs. So pace, technology, price. Um, and I, we, it has been useful for stakeholders and policymakers and others to really understand that we have some choices to make. And uh, we should be working together to make the best choices for our customers, for the environment, for the economy, 
uh, as we move forward. When do you have to make a decision? Like, has what, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question because there are six options. Which do we <laughs> pursue? Uh, it will go through that. Those six scenarios, Alice, will go through a process in front of both regulatory commissions in 2021, uh, and they will give us feedback. Uh, we will also uh, continue to be engaged with stakeholders in both states looking for how quickly should we be adding renewables, what are the renewables we should add, how do we add battery storage. So I think there will be a number of initiatives um, moving along at the same pace to take those plans and make them actionable. And I think 2021 and 2022 will be critical years. Uh, to turn those uh, plan that planning document into actual executable plans. And we feel some urgency about it because we're sitting here almost in 2021. 2030 is right around the corner when you consider how long it takes to build and permit things. So we're anxious to get moving and feel like we can make a lot of good progress um, already on uh, something called the base plan, which... Um, you know, is the lowest cost option. And then we can pursue some of the more aggressive technologies as the policy and stakeholder support continues to mature. So at the end of the day, do you feel, and I know you're early in the exercise, but do you feel that your customers are going to be willing to pay more money for electricity, even though they know it's green? It's easy to have the it's conversation on the C-suite level. It's like, I can ask you these questions on a C-suite level, right? But when I get my bill... I might feel very differently. And I just want to get a sense of, from you, like how that conversation is right now. It's, it's such a good question, Alex, because when I say reliability and affordability, I really mean it. When you think about customers, I can have a group of customers who want 100% renewables tomorrow. And I also have a group of customers that would say to me, I can't afford one more dollar for energy because I, you know, it's too much. I'm on a fixed income, and therefore, I can't afford more. And so as we talk about these environmental goals that we all share, as we talk about generation transition, we can't lose sight of affordability. And so we continue to drive productivity, lowering our costs, looking for ways that we can take costs out of our business, Alex, because you can't put all this investment in and just allow prices to keep going up. That is not a sustainable solution. And so as we look at the generation transition that we laid out, on the, you know, the lowest cost option would be about a 1% increase in the price of energy uh, per year. Uh, it should get closer to 70%. We see that in the 2 to 2.5% 2 range. 